Hi everyone and welcome to the BGS podcast. I'm Elian, I'm a software engineer and community at Astro. Um, I'm hosting the BGS podcast today alone since um, Eamon is currently traveling in Jordan. His pictures are looking awesome if you haven't seen them. Check it out on um, X, I guess we should call it now. Um, nonetheless, um, I'm here joined today by, um, I will call him my friend and also a very seasoned speaker, um, Daniel Afonso. Hey, Daniel. Hey there, um, and you can definitely call me call me my friend. You're obviously my friend, man. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks, yeah, th another friend. And thanks for having me. Uh, it's it's yeah, really no great. It's really great to be here. I'm sad that Eamon is is not here as well, but is is yeah. using a well deserved vacation. So. Oh yeah, the <laughs> pictures are really amazing. Have you seen them? Yeah, it's I've, like I've so sunny. That... It's crazy. It's... <laughs> yeah, actually, um, do you remember our first meeting? It was online, and you actually introduced me yes. uh, for one of my first online talks. Actually, it um, was. It was in. Uh, was it the uh, React Global Online? Summit yeah. By, yes. By exactly. Geekle, Geekle. I always forget how to pronounce. By Geekle. Geekle. Yeah. I always forget. I always forget how to pronounce the company's name. But I have a problem with pronunciation names. I don't know why. <laughs> um, well, you you seem to catch my name now. Yeah, now, now now I do, but man, we have we have been together in person like three or four times in the in the neck in the last couple of months. It's, it's really funny because our first meeting was about two years ago. It was just online. Then we have been talking for about a year online, and then we finally met each other. Um, I think it was React Brussels yeah, this year. It was. It was in React Brussels. I, I, I was super happy about it, and I was like, man, I'm gonna finally yeah. meet Elian in person. That's definitely yeah. one, one of the highlights of the year for me, <laughs> and I mean it. I really do. <laughs> Oh, wow. That's actually amazing. No, it, it was really fun because that's always the thing I feel like with, with especially like tech, Twitter and such, it's actually a really small community and we have just really loud voices <laughs> online and you feel like you already are friends, then you meet each other for the first time and immediately you are friends. It's, exactly. You, it's you, such a weird vibe. No, well, I, no, I, it's not a weird vibe. It's a good vibe. It's it, fun. It, it definitely is. I feel like that's... I completely agree. Like it, this is a very, a very small community, or at least the people that are speaking, are doing conferences, yeah. doing meetups, doing events, whatever. You start to see the same faces after after a while, and you start yeah. building these relations with people, like like us, for instance. I introduced you in React, this React Global conference. I was emceeing that one. Then we started chatting online, chatting on Twitter, and you start building this friendship because like you don't need to meet the person in person. I would say yeah, in yeah. person to build a friendship. And like, I remember when we first met, met saw each other, like, oh, I'm going to give you a hug in person because we are, <laughs> it's the it's the relationship that already existed. We, it was just a way of, okay, now finally we are together in person and we get to chat and hang out and have some beers. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> if you're in Brussels and you're with me, you definitely have are some, having some beers. I, I don't think I don't think that you need to be in Brussels and, and be <laughs> to have some beers. <laughs> That's true. We also did have some beers in Berlin as well. <laughs> Actually, twice. Um, you were at City Jazz Berlin and React Day Berlin, right? No, City Jazz Berlin. I was not there. I missed. Right. I ended up. I ended up missing that one. I had a conference on the uh, day on the day before, and unfortunately, could not go to that. Right. One. Which conference did you have before? Uh, I was on DevCon, which happened in Bucharest, in Romania. Mm. So um, I was. Oh, wow, amazing. There the day before, and then I couldn't travel to Berlin, so I had to. Yeah. Skip it. No, I didn't mean it makes sense. Because that's, that's also one of the things. When you're doing conferences back to back, it takes a toll. And one of the things that I oh. that I learned this year, and mm. and I'm steering the conversation for this part. I don't know if the, this is where don't we worry. want to go. But one of the things I learned this year is that you don't want to have back to back conferences, and especially seven conferences in a month. That's what yeah, happened to no. me in June. In June, I had seven conferences in five Holy five damn. different. Five or four different countries. I don't remember anymore. But I got to the end of June and I was like, okay, I need a break. I need to rest for a month to not do anything Can else imagine. because my brain was like, okay, this doesn't work anymore. <laughs> I must say, like, I already feel it like doing just three days of conference. Like if you have a conference that lasts for two days and you're there for three or four days, you come back and on the plane back, you're just dead, dead inside. You're just, your social battery is gone. You just need to take some days to, to like replenish your, your batteries a bit. It's, it's insane. It's definitely funny because on the way back, even if you're on the way there, even if you're tired, you have the adrenaline of, oh, I'm going to do a conference. I'm going to be, be mm. with my friends. I'm going to meet new friends. I'm going to have fun. 
but then after like when you did ev- when you did the thing the adrenaline stops kicking in you're relaxed you're it's just oh now i have to travel back home and then you take the part of oh crap this is traveling i'm tired of traveling uh-huh. i'm tired of airports i'm tired of security checks i'm tired of uh, random checks on the airport it mm-hmm. gets to a point where i it's it's worth it because you were able to hang out with your friends and you were able to share things with the community and help other people grow because that's why we do these things it's definitely mm-hmm. to help others grow but you get so tired afterwards that it yeah yeah it's it's definitely worth it but you're just dead inside afterwards exactly the thing is like after react day berlin um my flight connect connecting flight got delayed by three hours and i was just sitting in the airport like huh it was so late at night i was only back um in brussels by i think somewhere at 1 a.m it mm-hmm. was so late and I was so tired. I just wanted to go to sleep. <laughs> and I still had to travel travel for another hour from Brussels to Ghent, where mm-hmm. I live. Um, so yeah, it takes a toll. React Day Berlin was terrible for both of us in that sense. Because your, your mm-hmm. fight got delayed, mine got cancelled. and Oh, that's true. Yeah, and that, that's a funny story for people. Apparently, in some airlines, if you miss a flight, they'll cancel the entirety of the, of the rest of the flights of your booking. I didn't know that because here's a story. I was, I was going to Berlin. I had my booking to Berlin, but before I had to go to, to Poznan in Poland and I had to book another flight. So what I did was I had already booked my flight to Berlin, um, but I booked another flight to Poznan and I said, okay, for Poznan, I get um, a bus to go to Berlin. So I missed the flight that I had from Portugal to Berlin because of that, the airline, in this case, they said, oh, apparently when this happens, uh, our rules is if you miss one flight, we'll, we'll cancel all of the flights in this reservation. So I oh, had damn. two connection flights to come back to Portugal that were cancelled, and I only figured out like at two a.m. the day before, when I was when when I got back to the room and I was going to do the check in, I was like, oh, my flight got cancelled. Why? And oh, it was all the stress of figuring out why did that happen, how did it happen, booking a flight on on the flight, basically a new one, uh, paying for it, and basically. This is why we ended up, I ended up getting very sad because I had to get an earlier flight and the hard part was I didn't get to say goodbye to everyone in person, which was, oh, su- yeah, that's was true. super, I remember. super, su- I got super, super mad with that. But oh well, fun stories that you get on the road. Yeah, that that is true. It's it's always like literally a little bit of traveling, but also in the sense of you have so many experience on such a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. And also you were my you were my hotel neighbor. We were neighbors. We were, <laughs> we were hotel, hotel neighbors. That that was a and, fun, and a fun story. The, <laughs> yeah, one of the funny things is that actually um that week that we had React Day Berlin was also the launch week of Astro 4. Mm-hmm. So I was very busy doing calls and very busy like releasing Astro 4 and the documentation. And um while I was on those calls, Daniel could actually hear me both uh, <laughs> from the call and uh, from the other room, just screaming to my computer. <laughs> it was it was very fun. Yeah, I ended I ended up joining the Astro meeting that you were guys having on, on Discord, mm. and, then, and I was like, I was hearing you in the other room, and then after some delay, I would hear then get to my computer. So it was definitely a a fun story, but it, yeah. it makes it it makes it better. So when we had to leave in, it we have to go to stuff. We would always find each other and just go together. So from that part, it's way better. Aside from having people in different mm-hmm. places or the hotels or different hotels, that part oh, yeah. makes it way better. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Like if if you are a speaker and you are just like in the hotel with all the speakers, that's so much fun because you can just say, "Hey, someone that wants to go for dinner tonight," and then we'll all just wait in the lobby and head out together. And it's always a experience with friends. Um, that's, like that's, we went to grab kebab together and that's so much fun. You just, after the conference, you go somewhere and you have dinner together. You talk about so much cool things, um, mainly about technology because we never get tired of it. Or, or, be, <laughs> or beers if we're hanging, hanging around with you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That, that tends to happen. That tends to happen. <laughs> but that's definitely one of the things why I love doing this because the part of mm-hmm. sharing knowledge, it's why I started doing this. Is I started mm-hmm. doing conferences, meetups, vlogging because i wanted yeah. to share the little bit of what i know but then come this upside where when you're going to these things you start seeing the same people all over for instance mm-hmm. i think at this this year i did like six or seven conferences with tages 
like five or six conferences with Matheus Albuquerque, five or six mm-hmm. conferences with Attila. So you start getting to hang around with the same people and you start building these friendships. Uh, I, mm-hmm. I, I was joking but with Tejas the other day, but it's true. I think this, this year I spent more time with Tejas than I did with, with some members of my family. Because well, I don't in, in a back, sense, we yeah, are colleagues. We are. That's. I don't consider colleagues. I think like it's real mm. friendships that you bring. You can also build mm-hmm. build a call. You can also be colleagues at a certain thing because you start contributing and you start helping out each other. That's definitely something that comes on the on the good side of it. But for me, when I see a speaker list and I start seeing people that I know, I get excited because I know okay, I'm gonna be with my friends again. For instance, a mm-hmm. CDJS London. I was checking the speaker list of the one, the people that I already confirmed. And when I start seeing, oh, I know this person, I hanged out with this person, oh, I know this person from there, I know this person from there, like, I just get genuinely happy because, okay, woo, I'm going I'm gonna go share knowledge and I'm going to hang out with my friends. That's definitely yeah. the motivation of why it's not as tiring when you leave. It, it's it's mm. tiring, but knowing that you are just hanging out with your friends, it also makes it worth it because then you get these friendships and you get all this good thing aside yeah. from whatever and that and happens in conferences no, no, that, and events. That is definitely true. But also, like, um, we've been talking about conferences a lot and about um, speaking at conferences. How did you get into speaking at conferences? That's a great question. Um, I know it has something to do with Brazil, right? Brazil no. JS? No. no. That's Attila. Portugal, Portugal. Sorry. <laughs> Portugal JS. Brazil JS, something it's like Attila. You're, you're, you're thinking about the wrong Portuguese speaker. Right. <laughs> But right. one's from Brazil, but the other from Portugal. Um, basically, it came from wanting to become a developer advocate. I think that's kind of what motivated me in the first place. Um, basically, it was like five, six years ago. I haven't been doing this for a long time. I would say like in person, I only have like one year and a half of experience doing talks in person. Um, I did some online with COVID, but... Let's not jump uh, fences or Mm -hmm. whatever. Um, (laughs) When I was attending a conference here in Portugal called J -J Nation, um, and this time I was doing backend. I was mostly a backend developer. I wasn't doing any frontend. And then there were were these people on stage that called themselves developer advocates. I was like, what the heck is this thing? Because I was a junior developer back then. I had no idea what the role entitled. And I was remember chatting with one of my mentors back then and told him, Oh, developer advocacy, you probably would like that role. Like, okay, I have no idea what this is. I'm going to research it. And I opened the job description of some companies. I was saying, oh, this is definitely interesting because basically, in a sense, you're getting paid to help people um, and to build bridges between communities, to build bridges between yes. companies and communities. But you're helping people. That's like the main goal of it. You have to be empathic. You have to be able to take others in mind when you're doing this role. And mm-hmm. I said, okay, wow, you can you can get paid to do that? I'm like, okay, so let's start building my career to jump into this role once an opportunity shows up. And what I didn't know was that, well, it's not a very common role, <laughs> apparently. And there mm-hmm. was no companies hiring in Portugal for this. And that was a bit of a struggle. I... I it took me four years of working into becoming a developer advocate, but wow! In a, in a sense, it was good because I got to put this path forward. So I started do blogging. I wasn't confident in talking. I hated being on stage. The first type of talk I ever did was a mess, and everyone hated it. Everyone gave me terrible feedback on it, but it was also good because then I started knowing what not to do. Um, mm-hmm. But I said, okay, I'm not confident on this. I don't know what to speak about because I also had that mentality of, well, probably I'm not going to do a talk or a presentation about something that someone else already did. Well, if this person already did this thing, they are way better than me. They know this way better than I do. Why should I even waste people's time? That was my mentality back then. Oh, I relate on so many levels with that. Yeah. But then <laughs> Go ahead. there's something that changed my mind on there, but it started with vlogging. So I started vlogging. I, I did a, a first vlog post. One of the things that I was really good and I got really proud on doing was I was really good at testing in React applications. So I was the, in the meantime, I transitioned from back end to front end. Um, I was really good at testing. I really liked testing. I, and this was happened to be at the same time that the testing library had just came out. So people 
we're not using the testing library yet, people are still using Enzyme. A lot of people are like, oh, how do we migrate from this to that? So I started blogging on that. Then I did some JavaScript posts. I did some, basically what I started, and there was one person that was re re um, uh, really important for me on this part, uh, Swix. Uh, he mm -hmm. started promoting this thing of learning in public and he did a lot of talks on that. And I was like, okay, this is mm -hmm. learning in public. That seems a concept. Let's try this out. Probably people will judge me, people will tell me I'm terrible, but let's give it a shot. And I started, as I was learning JavaScript, I was growing in JavaScript, I was growing in concept, I was blogging about them. So that was actually a way for me to, every time I wanted to learn something, I would force myself to write about it. Because for me to be able to click and to be able to explain something to people that was reading those things, I had to understand them very, very well. That's one of the things that I, that still happens to me nowadays is, for me, it's very hard to speak about the subject if I just have a, a shallow understanding of it. For instance, I can give an example. Hydration. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, hydration is attaching event handlers and making sure that thing, whatever. This is the shallow definition of what hydration is. Mm -hmm. For me, this doesn't work because my brain doesn't connect in the, in the back part of, okay, this is what you say, but how does it work? That's one of the things that, that, then that I still struggle a lot with. Um, is getting into a point where I can disconnect from the, the shallow definition to the actual implementation because my brain needs to connect these things so I feel comfortable speaking about it. And this was good because, yeah. okay, I was writing, I wanted to be comfortable and make sure that I actually knew what the heck I was saying. And as this grown, I started to see, oh, wait, people like the post, nobody criticizes. That's one of the things that I was expecting everyone to yell at me and telling and telling me I was suck I sucked and I wasn't good and I should get the way out there whatever, uh, all the imposter syndrome thoughts that came from it. But um, after a while, I said, okay, I have a couple of blog posts. What if I got them together and I did a talk? So that was my first talk ever was gathering a bunch of blog posts that I had written, getting them together um, from stuff I published back then. I was using Medium. Stuff mm -hmm. I published internally at the company I was working as uh, uh, there back then, mm -hmm. and let's build a talk. So I did what now I, I I never do, which is I didn't create an abstract, I didn't create a title, <laughs> I just started building slides, and yep. I ended up with my first talk called React Hooks Broke My Tests. Now what? Fun fact: This talk was created in 2019, 2018. I presented the last time this year. So I oh, managed wow. to get this talk through three, four years, presenting them every year because it's still, it is still an actual talk, a talk that still mm -hmm. holds these dates. And I kept updating it. The last time I presented was in CDJS London um, in, the, in the beginning of this year. So it's mm -hmm. still something that holds up. Then I turned it into a workshop, but this comes into, into a different part of my journey. But um, yeah, so I built this talk and... I said, okay, now that I have a talk, what do I do? Um, and I presented internally at my company. So my company back then, um, I was doing unofficial DevRel, which means I was not getting paid to do DevRel, but I was basically applying the same things I do <laughs> as, a, as a DevRel internally. Um, yeah. So, and I was holding these sessions where we would share presentations and I started presenting it there. And then I said, okay, people seem to like it. So how do I maximize this thing and make sure that I can get it to more people? Because I didn't know. I didn't know about CFPs. I didn't know about abstracts. I had no idea how. This is one thing that they don't teach you. And it's definitely in need for conferences and meetups is how to start up as a conference uh, speaker yes. or something. Now there are a lot of talks about that, but back not back then. I feel like some of them exist, but we don't never know where to start. I think that's that's kind of the point. Um, mm -hmm. And I was scrolling through Twitter because there were some meetups that I used to to follow, to watch online, attend. And there was this one. And wait, that, no, this was the secondary. The first one I applied to a, a conference that happens here in Portugal. And I got accepted. It was something on GitHub. You submitted the, the talk description. I got accepted. But then something called COVID came. And the conference was was cancelled. And this would actually be my first time speaking in person. And this was supposed to be in 2020, something like that. 2019, I don't remember anymore when, when it started and when it ended. But 2020, mm -hmm. um, I got accepted for it. But then COVID hit and the conference never happened. 
So, fun fact, my first ever talk never happened. In, in person, never happened because it was cancelled. But then yeah. it came this part of the meetup. I was scrolling to Twitter, and one of the things that I've always tried to do is understand who what who was doing what, for who was, who was building what, uh, what could I learn from them. And there was this thing happening in the United States, in Philadelphia, called React Adelphia, um, which was run by um, Demetrius. Clark, I think he's working at Clark yeah. right now. Clark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dimitris was, Dom was running this thing in Philadelphia. And this was one of the things that I don't know how I happened, happened upon it, but I used to attend the, comp the meetup. Uh, it was remotely, obviously. And I submitted and I said, okay, come present a talk at the meetup online. And, and that's how it started for me, basically. And fun fact, this talk is still on YouTube right now. My first mm -hmm. ever talk online, it's on YouTube. I was actually listening it to, to uh, it a couple of hours ago because I was organizing my playlists for talks, which is something that I never had until today. Um, oh, I really? Yeah, I just created Even it I a couple that. of hours ago. I was like, okay, perhaps wow. I should have this. People might want to mm -hmm. get ideas. So I, was, I found that talk and I was like, oh man, this still exists. And it's interesting because then you start reviewing and you see an, evo an evolution on how you present the stuff that you did back then. It's, it's really, really cool. That's how you can start. Um, I, was, I was going to say a word, but it doesn't exist in English. I was going to say it in something like, I don't know if this happens to you. You have a word and you're going to say it oh, in yeah. English and you translate it, but you don't translate it. You say how, you would, how it would make sense in your language <laughs> in English. Um, basically, what I, what I was going to say is appreciate. You appreciate the growth yeah. that you that you have from it. Oh, um, most definitely. Like it's it's very funny that you you mentioned that your first talk got um like just never happened. I actually had the same thing. So we started probably around the same time. Um, uh, my first talk was also during COVID and got postponed. Uh, it was actually also at a local meetup. I mm -hmm. did eventually do it, but about a year later. And that's when Astro already like grew mm -hmm. a lot and, and became way, way bigger. Um, and it's crazy because I still give that same talk also today, but of course, updated and do of new course. stuff. And it's amazing when you see like the first recordings and you see the recording of React Day Berlin. It's such a big difference. Like there has been almost two years in between those two and I've grown so, so much. It's, it's insane. Well, at least I hope I can say that. <laughs> no, but I, I, from what I remember of you, you definitely gr grew on the stuff that, that, that I've seen, definitely. I think like, and this is not me uh, saying, yeah, you definitely did just because I think like the first talk that I, that I heard you do, you were not mm -hmm. as confident as you are, uh, you are right now. I think you are mm. way more at ease. There's always the nervous when you get on stage, but now you are way more at yeah. ease with yourself but that well there, there is a big difference well for me personally there there was a big difference um after um js world last year um js world last year happened in amsterdam mm -hmm. around in february around the same time that we released astro 2 and they they had asked me to come and speak about astro i wasn't working for the astro technology company back then mm -hmm. um but they also invited fred Mm -hmm. And Fred, so now basically my boss, but also the create, well, one of, of the creators of Astro. Um, so I was stressing so much, so much. Um, and I was like, oh, damn, like the creator of the thing I'm talking about, <laughs> like that's basically doing a solid talk in front of Ryan. It, yeah. it is stressful, let's say. Um, but actually afterwards, Fred came to me and said, hey, you have done this talk so, so well. I couldn't have done it better. Thank you so much. And we, we got talking. Uh, even though we we did talk online, of course, but mm -hmm. it's it's different in person. Um, and yeah, then I was like, okay, maybe I am kind of good at this. People <laughs> have asked me. People have um, like paid for my stay here and paid for my travel to come here mm -hmm. to speak to them. People are paying to not see just me, but like are paying to come to the conference, and they are happy. Once you experience that, and um, you feel like you're not an imposter anymore mm -hmm. like in a sense i do still sometimes struggle with that but who doesn't um but i think at that time i got like a confidence boost like okay i can do this if i Definitely. prepare well and if i do like i give 150 percent of myself mm -hmm. i can do this and i am worth uh to do, well i am worth it to do this basically have definitely like and in a sense, we have very similar stories because the first time I ever spoke outside of Europe I went, was when I went mm. to React India and I was doing this mm. uh, testing library uh, talk and yeah. the keynote speaker of that day was Ken Dodds. And I was like, oh, cool. 
I'm going hmm. to present about the testing library to the creator. <laughs> and, I, and I was... It is stressful. I was super stressful. I remember like the, the, the weeks before I was like, oh, what is going to happen? I'm not, I'm not sleeping well. And that's the thing. I didn't have the experience. And this was last... The fun thing, this was last year. Um, mm-hmm. But I didn't have half of the experience that I have right now. Last year, in person, I, had, I did like seven or eight talks. This year, I did almost 30 or something like that. Yeah. So Same. there's a completely different aspect of growth that you have there. But I was super stressed because, okay, my in my mind, and I know that Kent is the kindest person ever, and it mm-hmm. definitely is. And I was like, oh, Kent is going to see this. And I was like, oh, this dude is full of crap. I don't like this talk. and just preached crap. Which I know that I was not doing, but in your mm-hmm. mind, you're always like, oh, they're going to judge you. Yep. And, okay, cool. I couldn't sleep for the, the days before, the, the, the weeks before, the months before. I was super stressful. When the day came, I found out that I was going to speak after this person called Tejas Kumar. Hmm. And that was the... I've seen Tejas speak online, but that was the first time I've seen Tejas speak in person. And I was like, okay... So I'm going to speak about the testing library to the creator after following up pages. So like, okay, how the heck do I do this? Like, if I was already stressed, I got even more stressed after. I remember that I I, I had to take like a a calming pill that day just so I could be more relaxed because Mm. I was stressing so much. And I think like this was the the, the only time I did that because I was sweating from every part. And... (laughs) But one one thing that really helped there, like, and this is why I really like Tejas as well, is he's super straightforward and he gives it the best advices. And I was chatting yeah. with him before, and I was like, dude, how do you expect me to follow up to you? Go after and done the talk that you just did. I'm super stressed. I don't know what to do. I was like, dude, j- you just do this. And now picture picture Tejas. He got off. To, got off. Man, just do this. If the talk goes bad, you don't care. You just need to go there and have fun. That's what I do. Like, you go there and have fun. Because if you have fun, you're going to enjoy your time on stage. You're going to connect with people. People are going to relate with you. And if the talk is shit, oh, and I don't know if I can curse, sorry about that. Or if I can, I can. But of course. basically what they just <laughs> did. If the talk is shit, you're going to have the feeling in your mind that you enjoyed it and that you had fun. Yeah. And this is something that hadn't clicked to me yet. I never thought about it. It's like, oh, you can have fun on stage. Yeah, what? yeah, yeah. You're not supposed just to go there and be like standing still, presenting something to the audience and pointing, detailing stuff. The, the That's thing not is, what you're if, supposed if you're to having, do. Exactly. If you're having fun on stage, the audience will definitely feel that and follow you into that enthusiasm that you're representing with. Fun fact. That was, to this day, still one of the best talks I did. <laughs> really yeah and i was super stressed um oh, wow and but that's i also i think like one of the things that happened there was and this is a good thing it's a good bad thing of, of following someone like tages on stage which is which is mm. if you're immediately after him he leaves the audience warm for you so the audience is already prepared yeah. and you know how tages is is his jokes he says a bunch of stuff so the audience was already at his so Either I was going to go and crash and completely crash the mood or uh, even if I was reasonable or medium, a medium speaker or someone that does the bare minimum, it would make it better. But the thing is, I went there and I tried to have fun. I did the thing, okay, I'm just going to go there. I'm going to enjoy. I know that the cameraman was super mad at me because that was the first time that I started moving around the stage. It has something that I never did. I used to stay I, still. I didn't know that. You do move a lot. I move yeah. a lot now, but that when I started speaking, I would stay still on my spot. I wouldn't move because it was stress. I didn't know. And these are things that you learn as you get more comfortable. And I started mm. moving a lot. And I was like, I was walking. I was getting excited. I was doing stuff. And that's the thing. I had done this talk 15, 16, 17 times already. So I knew it in the back of my mind. I was doing this thing like, and I had so so much fun doing it and afterwards Kent came, came to me gave me a bunch of feedback it's, it's, he told me the stuff that, that he really liked like the amazing person that he is um, mm-hmm. and then I ended up doing this this talk again in front of him at CDJS London this year so <laughs> in two, I, I did two times the I did the talk two times but I was definitely stressful and it was a super great learning experience for me on that part and Thanks to Ken, thanks to Tejas. There are definitely one of the things that I started doing as a speaker is picking the people that I like to see on stage 
and see mm. what I can em- what I can em- emulate from them. Because there are things oh, really? that yeah, there are there are things that I see that people do that are like okay, maybe I could try something like that, or maybe I c- and sometimes when you're on stage you forget that this happens. But once you start doing oh, this yeah. a bunch of times, at least for me, I start remembering. Oh, let's try this part out. Let's try this thing out. Um, and when you start hanging out with other speakers, you can ask, oh, what? How did you do that? Why did you do that? How does this work? And then, like, you can learn so yeah. much from many people. Well- Maybe a little secret, but like the first talks I gave, especially like the, the longer form talks, not the lightning talks, I used to write out my text completely. Like in my slides, my text was completely there. So I was kind of reading, but not really. Like I was reading with But you would look presence. at the audience sometimes. Yes, yes, exactly. Because I knew the text and everything. But I would even write down the pauses in my words or the ums and like how I would pronunciate some, some things. Mm-hmm. And now I don't need any of that anymore. And I can just go because exactly like you said, you know the talk in the back of your mind and you know that actually in in a stressful moment, it will start flowing automatically in a mm-hmm. sense. I, um, I, still do, I still do this to, the, to this day. The first time I'm building a talk, um, I like to r- write. Now I started getting, as I started doing this. I did like eight different talks this year. So I had to find a way to make this easier. But... Um, in the beginning, what I would do, and for this talk specific, the one that I was talking about, I had the entire mm-hmm. script written out, and I had the transitions. Yeah. I was like, okay, this is how you start this slide. This is what you present on this slide. This is how you transition to the next slide. I had all this thing written, written, but wow. the thing is, I ended up letting the speaker notes to be my curse, in a sense, um, because I was doing a talk on... Um, on Remix last year as well. I did one talk that initially was called React Remixed. Then I mm-hmm. re- changed it completely this year to Learn Remix accidentally, Learn the Web, because then I ended up changing the concept. But when I started doing that talk, I was not confident on the topic. So, mm. and what I mean, I'm, I was not confident on the topic. I mean, I knew the basics. I knew the, like I said, from, for migration, I knew the, the shallow part, but I didn't knew the part yeah. of it. So what I did the first time was I had the slides, I had the talk, and then I had on the speaker notes the information that I was not confident about, but I found that right. was important to give. Mm. What happened was I got to a conference once and I couldn't figure out a way to put the speaker notes working. And I, I had exactly zero speaker mean. notes. Mm. And that's when I learned, yeah, I'm never going to use speaker notes or rely on them anymore. Um, yes. And then because something that happened as well in, in a different conference was I was, I was a, a bit overweight last year. I ended up losing a bunch of like 12, 13 kilos from this, this year from the last one and getting in my resistance. But the thing is, I was reading and with the adrenaline and the stress, I didn't know how to breathe. So basically I was presenting and I was going, <gasps> and you, you would hear this thing on stage and, you, and some microphones because of sensibility, you, you hear yourself breathe and all those things. Um, and because I was reading, I didn't know how to stop. I didn't know where to put the, the brakes on those things. And because sometimes the adrenaline, it just kicks in and you don't know when to stop, especially mm-hmm. when you get people that are experts on the audience and you know, how am I going yeah. to speak to this in front of this person? Mm. And that's when I ended last year, I said, okay, I'm never going to rely on speaker notes anymore. So I started this year completely without speaker notes. I had zero, 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 zero speaker notes. I said, okay. Okay, I'm going to memorize what I have to do. Halfway through the year, when I started doing these seven, eight talks at the same time, which had different complete contexts, what I started to add was some bullet points. But why did I start adding that? Because I don't know if you notice uh, when I'm presenting recently, but I'm using my iPhone as a, as a, mm-hmm. a slide changer. And the good thing yeah. with the iPhone is that you can have some speaker notes there. So what I have is some very small bullet points, like three, four words on for each slide, just so I remember like the, sometimes it's just like mind tricks. So words that when you read them, your brain clicks on what, where do you want to go? And I started mm-hmm. adding some of these things in case I forget, because when you're changing context, for instance, I did, I did talks, I, was remem- I remember that in June, I did talks on mock service worker, React query, uh, remix, solid, and uh, and another one I forgot. There were five different talks, but I did it, I did I repeated two of them. Th- there's a lot of context switching, even though it's solving the JavaScript yeah, ecosystem. Yeah. But there's a lot of context switching, and your brain, when you're transitioning from conference to conference, especially like 
one back to back, you get to a point where you cannot remember everything or have enough time to practice. So yeah. that's when I started adding these small bits of information there. But it's about finding the style that's comfortable to you. You, you once you start doing this enough times, you start fi- finding okay, this is what I like to do. This is what I dislike. This is where I want to grow. Um, mm-hmm. There are many things that you. I, I don't know if you have anything right now that you think like it annoys you that you do one stage. Um, um, yeah, sometimes I put my hands in my pockets, which <laughs> makes it look like I'm bored. That, people that, have told that, me. That's why it's good to have a clicker or something like that. Since I started using a clicker, that never happens. Because mm-hmm. that that's one of the things I ended up... I have some photos, some conferences that I would... Like, your normal instant sometimes as a human is to protect yourself. And when you're on stage, you there's the adrenaline, there's the fear, there's yep. the thing. And an instinct of humans is to do this. Or to do this, or to do this. or Because basically you're protecting yeah, yourself. This, yeah. You start doing these things. And when you start doing these things... Mm-hmm. And you start yeah. seeing photos, you think, oh, okay, I'm protecting myself. The adrenaline. And, you, and, and we do this unwilling, unintentionally in this case. Mm. Um, that's definitely something I struggled with at the beginning of the year. But now since I started using the clicker on the phone, like it's way harder for me to do that because then I have to use the, the phone to change slides and to do stuff. So I, I stopped doing this. Yeah. One thing that I struggled a lot and I still struggle is Q&As. Uh, there's yes. something those about, are hard th- there's something about q and a's that my mind just completely stops working um, i feel you that was one this year i don't know which conference it was at this point but i basically i was speaking and i got to a point where my brain noticed that i was saying a, the same word a bunch of times and i started getting mad at it so i was like i was speak- i was answering <laughs> the person i was like oh i'm saying this word a lot and then every time I saw the word, I was like, hmm. And, but the thing is, imagine this on a QA, you ask questions, and, and then the speaker is answering to you, like, oh, I'm saying this word a lot. And then, because as an, as an attendee, you won't notice these things. That's all in your mind, because you're the one who's getting social awkward, all those things. But that's why mm-hmm. I like to have speakers evaluate each other. That's something that I do with some, with some people. I don't, I don't know if, if I ever did that with you, but for instance, with, I did this with Tages, I did this with Mateus. Uh, and mm. I asked him, okay, at the end of my talk, I would like you to give me the hardest feedback that you have. And, right. Or the stuff. And then this time it was Mateus. Mateus was like, dude, you just got stuck on that thing and nobody was even noticing, but you were just pushing your attention to that part. Because I don't mm. know what, the Q&A just triggers a part of ad- adrenaline that I didn't know how to react. That's why mm. I started doing workshops. So basically what I did because was... Because people okay, ask you more questions. How do I fix this? So I said, okay, I'm mm. going to... St- put myself into a room with four, for four hours with people asking me mm-hmm. questions for four hours. And, wow. this, and this, is, this is crazy. Like, if you think about this, why would you expose yourself to do something like that? But that's basically the way that I found, okay, if I'm doing this workshop, I'm teaching people, and I'm exposing myself to four hours or five or eight, depends on the workshop time, of Q&A. Because my workshop... As the teaching part, but it's fully interactive. So people can stop me at any moment, ask questions. Mm-hmm. And after a while, after the second or the third workshop, it, it started getting better. But uh, the first time I did the workshop, man, it was crazy. I was so <laughs> stressed because I was like, oh, people are going to ask questions. And then that's the, the thing in your imposter syndrome that starts telling you, okay, that's when people are going to find out that you're an imposter, that you don't know crap of this. Because exactly. even though you think you know, exactly, like your brain is always going to tell you, oh, you don't know these things. And people are going to judge you. And people are going to judge you if you... For instance, one thing that I was super afraid of, and now it got way better and I feel super proud of being able to achieve this, is to say I don't know on stage. Mm. That's one of the things that I thought, okay, oh, if you go on stage and someone asks you a question and you say you don't know, people are going to judge you. Uh, that's, but the, 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 the real truth is they're like, most of the times people just... If they ask you a question, they want to learn. But there are, are ways to handle these things. Like if you don't know, you can say, okay, sorry, I don't know about that anymore. I can definitely research. Uh, please ask me a question on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn or whatever about that. And let's connect mm-hmm. and let's chat about this afterwards. So you turn this part as also as an opportunity of growth. Um, I, yeah, I, d- this definitely. actually happened to me in, the, in a meetup I was doing in Poznan this month. Uh, someone asked me a question and I didn't know the answer. I, okay, I have no idea. Um, Mm. And the person at the end was came to me. Oh, sorry, I asked you that question. I didn't mean to to make you feel, to make you embarrassed. I didn't mean to make you 
say you don't know on stage like no man it's mm -hmm. completely it's completely okay you gave me an opportunity of growth as well and yep i think it's also important that people understand that we are on when we are on stage we don't know everything we just know enough there and we are confident and our goal is there is to help others mm -hmm. grow not to give the golden formula about everything being human is is able to say that you don't know stuff i think like this is getting very philosophical really quick but um, <laughs> i think that's also part of your growth it's as okay. human is to admit that you don't know stuff and get on mm -hmm. with your life <laughs> damn that's some really good, good and solid advice because i also like especially with all the hype going up about astro studio and and astro as itself as in the company mm -hmm. i get asked a couple of hard questions sometimes and i know i'm going to get them but I don't have a real answer for them. So on stage, I felt myself kind of walking around the question and answering something that was not really about the question. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I should just say like, mm, I don't know yet, or mm, we'll see about that in the future. Um, I can't give you an answer right now. Um, I, I don't feel very confident about that right now. Yeah, so yeah, definitely that's something but that the, I can... The redirection on. part is just this simple trick that mm. even sometimes when you get questions that, that can be a bit hostile, that, that happens sometimes. Mm -hmm. There are different types of countries, audiences, people. Some questions might not be asked the best with the best intention. If you redirect them, so basically if you say, okay, I don't know about that, ask, please reach out to me. It gives you time to think about it. It gives you time to research and it gives you time to give a better mm -hmm. answer to the person. I think like this is basically nobody ex or, or nobody should expect everyone to know everything on, on these things. So and basically it's also an opportunity for growth because if they ask you a question oh, yeah. and you don't know the next time. And then this is the thing that's important. The next time you're presenting that talk, you better be prepared for that question because that's true. that that's like the the. And I've tweaked slides because of this. I did one, one of the talks I did um, called All You Need Is A Contract. I tweaked slides because I had like four or five questions from people that were very focused on something. And basically, I was presenting that talk as a case study. And people started asking mm. me, oh, why didn't you choose this tool? Why didn't you choose that? Why didn't you choose that part or did this or that? Right. And part of being a case study is... This is the thing, things that I struggled, these things that I suffered. I didn't have all the information back then. Heck, I don't have all the information back now, but I could, uh, I could have definitely chosen that. I could definitely not choose that. But I think sometimes that's when you get these questions, you think, okay, perhaps I'm not explaining this the way that I should. And you can then tweak your slides and add information for the next time that you do a talk. But that's also part of presenting talks is keeping proving them. Yeah, exactly. Like keep reiterating and going over. I, actually, I had. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go, go ahead. ahead. Tell me what you're saying. Okay, I was going to ask you. Like, um, you you do give a lot of talks, but actually, do you still write code and stuff as well? I don't write as much as I would like to. I'm starting mm. to now. I think one of the things that I struggle with when transitioning to this role is okay. Now you're, you're not shipping to production. That's one of the thing. Yeah, I was used to shipping to production every day, doing every day, almost every day, but writing code every day. Mm -hmm. Now I write code once or twice per week. It's not as much, but, and it's yeah. most of the times not on the job. It's stuff that I'm searching after or building demos. And as a dev role, it's For very yourself. easy yeah. to, to get stuck on the, the cult tutorial hell, where you're just building stuff as tutorials or teaching stuff. Um, but that's why I started doing certain talks. If I start doing certain talks, I get to force myself to learn things. Mm. That's one trick that I started doing, which I don't recommend to anyone to do, is <laughs> if you want to learn something, create a talk about it or propose a talk about it. Don't do that. You're going to get in the a, in a world of hell. Basically, that's what I did for Remix. I had no idea on how it worked, what it was. Mm -hmm. I googled a bit to have the basics of basics and then I, mm -hmm. for to me to write a CFP. Then the talk was selected for a conference and then I said, okay, I have three months to know what I, what I can about this to present a talk, uh, which is enough in most, in, in most scenarios, but you get in a world of stress and pain, which is, uh, is not recommended mm. to, to anyone. I did it in the past. Um, I don't recommend doing it. It worked for me to, it, I was able to write a bunch of code, force me to learn a bunch of stuff, but um, it's a way. It's a way that I found last year to force me to code because I was not getting exposed to as much code as I was whilst I was shipping daily. 
I think now it has changed a bit because now you start you start go to conferences, start to hang out with people like you that are uh, that are doing stuff in frameworks in libraries and stuff, and you get to get more exposition to those things, and then you want to try mm. them out. So yeah, and that's when you go aside from the the tutorial hell or the tutorial flow that you usually get. Now you you start to say, okay, this person built this library, let's play with it. Uh, let's see what are the stuff that they are doing. Because that's one of the things that I struggled at the end of last year. Um, and that's when my imposter syndrome was the probably the the worst. Was I was in a conference and in the, in, I was hanging around with with Ryan Carniato, with Mishko and, and Shai, uh, Shai Resnick. And I was like <laughs> in this group. And, they, and then the Angular, uh, the Angular team was also there and they were talking about uh, adopting signals and they were asking Ryan questions and a bunch of stuff and I was sitting there like yeah I to be no, honest also I have no idea what they are talking about I never heard about these yeah. concepts I have zero idea and then inside I was like oh I'm terrible I'm crap I have no idea what these persons what these people are speaking about and zero knowledge of it and yeah. that's where where my imposter syndrome hit the heart because yes when you're shipping code to production, you're basically doing the same tasks every day. You're doing these mm -hmm. things. You, probably your company has your own design system. You're adopting your design system. You're building these things. Now you're hanging around in a group of people that are building the tools that you're used to build these things. And that's when you get to get hit with, oh, I don't have the knowledge that I thought I have. Um, yep. Like maybe I'm not as senior as my company considers me to be or whatever. I don't like seniority titles, but that's a completely different discussion. But um, yeah, yeah. maybe I don't know as much as I thought I did. And at, it's really hard. I think like, especially for me, because when you start going to many conferences, many people talking about different things, you want to learn all of them. You want to learn all of these things. And then you start getting it with imposter syndrome from all of the sides. Because like, oh, Quick, I have no idea about Quick. Astro, I have no idea about Astro. Vit, I have no idea about Vit. I have no idea about Vue, yeah. whatever, all the things that are happening. And you see people talk about all of these things. And then your brain starts thinking, oh, maybe I should know them and I have no idea. And then the imposter syndrome just, just goes crazy. Like, it's it's hard, it's funny, <laughs> it's... Uh, a retro you have to do a retrospective on yourself on where you want to go and where you want to learn. Um, mm. What I started to doing was I had to start calming these things and say, okay, I'm going to focus on different things. But at mm -hmm. the same time, I found a coping mechanism. So my talk, a nerdy guide to the web trending concepts, is basically a response for that. I picked topics. Yeah. So this talk right now, I have hydration, resumability, fine grain reactivity, and um, uh, edge computing. These Which are, is basically all the, the high um, hyped topics right now. These were the topics that I was hearing in every conference, and I was yeah. they were triggering my uh, imposter syndrome. So basically, this this talk ended up being like a sort of therapy for myself because I was forcing myself to learn these things that I was struggling with and I was blaming myself for not mastering mm. or feeling like I knew them fully. And I found a way, okay, let's figure out how I can simplify this to a three, four line uh, mental model and let's put comic books on these things and let's go, cr let's go crazy. But basically this talk showed up on a... Uh, on a kind of a catars catharsis, that's the word, uh, on um, on my imposter syndrome. So yeah, that's why I, re I like this talk so much because it's not just because of me being a huge comic book nerd and all those things, because basically it's a way for me to, every time something that shows up that I, I don't fully understand or I'm struggling with or I'm having anxiety or imposter syndrome about, this is mm -hmm. a way for me to force myself to research them. Because now right. I can include them in the slides, I can include stuff, and then I build the talk that you've seen and some people have seen, which ends up being interactive, ends up being a ton of fun. But um, it, it, it's fun now. I haven't I haven't thought about that until right now that we are discussing. So this is kind of being therapy as well. We're having some therapy <laughs> session. Um, I'm glad to be your therapist it's, today. It, it, it's kind of like a, a way, a, an escape patch for me to force myself to learn mm -hmm. stuff that I'm not fully confident on how it works because yeah. that's also one of the things that I struggle a lot with. If something doesn't click aside from the shallow part that I was talking about, mm -hmm. I have to dedicate a lot of time. This talk took me like a uh, 150 hours to build something like that. There are just four topics. 
Um, that is crazy. But um, but thankfully, like I had a lot of people helping me from that, and then I get feedback, mm. and then I start getting more people. Mm. But and that's why now that I, I want to keep doing this talk as many years because that's the thing. I won't get into details. You've seen the talk. Uh, if people want to want to see, it, they they can go check React Brussels recording for it, which is online. Um, but basically, this talk is a, a way for me to keep updated with stuff that I want to learn or force myself to learn, and build fun things out of it. Right now, I'm. I'm probably I'm thinking of starting I'm starting to brainstorm some ideas for server components for that. Um, awesome. Eamon asked me if I had done one for streaming, so that's also something that I'm thinking about adding. So that's kind yep. of there's this this thing that's helping me, and that's why at the end of this talk I tell people if you have topics that would like me to do this, please suggest me because the way I'm doing this for myself, but I, my objective with this is to help others. That's basically mm. the gist of this talk is to help others yeah. grow and help others not struggle as as I, I, I did. For instance, an ideal world. You suffer for them. <laughs> but, but but I think that's that's what should be for tech speakers sometimes as well, is for us to try these mm. crazy things and share them with people to make their lives easier. For mm. instance, I, I, I remember when, when concurrent mode started showing up in React and Hooks. When when was the transition for Hooks? Swix did this talk about implementing Hooks from scratch. And mm -hmm. basically, he suffered so that the rest of us didn't have to. So basically, he went ahead and implemented that thing and showed us how it works. For instance, uh, now Ben just released these React server components from scratch. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Actually, it's not React server components. It's building server components from scratch because he builds that thing completely from scratch. Basically, he yeah. suffered and he went ahead and explained how that thing was built so that the rest of us start understanding how that thing works. I think that should also be the objective on when you're producing content or talks or whatever. Um, but what I was going to say is, if I could visualize like this talk in an ideal world, would basically be, imagine that you have a conference and you have up front all the topics from the audience, from the speakers. And you know that there are going to be these keywords or these things that they are going to discuss that they are not going to go in depth because there's always mm. assumed knowledge on some things. Basically, yes. I would pick them up and this talk at the beginning would have all the topics at the 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 along the day people would hear about so that when someone would say Ooh. hydration when someone would say resumability when someone would say server components people add the mental model um, that that is such a crazy idea that would be like my end goal with this talk but that probably wow. will take a couple of years to happen if it ever happens well but, the uh, good part is uh, like you said you can reiterate so many times and add new yeah. topics and then make the audience choose because exactly like uh, if you haven't seen the talk please go go watch the talk it's it's amazing um if if people can just choose the talk or you can just choose the talk well the the, the topic for yeah. them then you have such a cool idea and such a valuable n extra knowledge crazy yeah, that, there there's a, a, a couple of stuff i think like this is one of the talks that probably I already know that it would be very hard for me to do something as good mm. as this one or on the same level, which is also good because then you <laughs> you keep challenging yourself on where, where's the oh. next step. Mm. But uh, now I'm struggling. I'm currently like brainstorming topics of things that I want to build next year. And I'm thinking, OK, but is this as good as that talk or at the same level? And then you start thinking, oh, it isn't. So do I still want to do it? Is it still mm. valuable? So how do I turn this into... There, there's a lot of well, process here that needs to be yeah, thought about. Yeah, the, the thing is, of course, you put your own bar so high and if you have to keep going over that every time, you're just going to tire yourself out and take all of the joy out of giving the talks. Yeah, there, there's there's an... At an, least an, I would feel like no, that. No, but yeah. I understand. That's definitely the, the interesting part on doing a retrospective on that part and, and thinking about it. But, well, mm. luckily, hopefully we now keep doing this talk for many years now the part well the art part would be to convince the same event to have the same talk again because that's the thing this talk, this talk can be done in the same event five six different times because people are not going to go to the same stories for mm. instance in um, in react de berlin it was the first mm -hmm. time i presented that version of hydration and i did this talk yep. like five times already but nobody had ever picked resumability with iron man so mm -hmm. there's the there's these patterns on <laughs> that's why this talk is super fun on this part because you won't always see the same things you'll see exactly. different parts so and, and super versatile yeah so there's there's a, a fun part on that on that but uh, but yeah th this came up from my imposter syndrome of all these topics on sitting mm. in an audience and thinking 
what the heck is resumability or what the heck is <laughs> fine grain reactivity fine grain oh, yeah. reactivity it's a super interesting topic in, in its sense because the first time I was exposed to it was from Ryan um, Ryan mm -hmm. when I met him in person I was not that a fan of solid or had, I heard about it but I didn't try it out and then mm -hmm. I met this person which was super humble super knowledgeable called Ryan Carniato mm -hmm. and he talked about it to me and I was like I don't know we are but i'm all in on all the things that you're doing from now on and i'm your super fan <laughs> from this point on that's the day where where i where i became a fan of of ryan but fine green reactivity it's a term and something that i struggled which is in its sense like i don't know how it happens for you but there are terms that when you hear in english they make sense in english but if you try to translate them to your mother tongue so if i try to translate them to Does portuguese it, it doesn't make sense and also and i i failed to connect with sometimes because something in my mind still thinks okay when i'm translating this i need to understand how it works in portuguese before i translate it into english something mm -hmm. <laughs> something like that and it took me a, like a couple of months for me to fully grasp my mind around it because somewhere somehow the translation was not working for me and mm. once again because i had this shallow knowledge of what it was um versus of what it actually was and what it how it actually works um I don't know. It, it, this might be weird for some people. For me, it's definitely a source of sh that I was struggling because somehow the translation was not the t the term. Like it's sometimes clicking. you see these terms yeah. in English that I have to ask people to explain me what do they mean in English because somehow the translation service in my brain doesn't fully <laughs> fully connect. Um, but I think like we should we shouldn't be scared of asking. I think like some one thing that happens a lot is we hear these True. terms and topics and people are like oh we should. Are we assuming that I know this and people sometimes don't ask because they're afraid they of getting want... judged or there's anxiety exactly. or there's the yeah. imposter syndrome. They're like, oh, if you ask about this, that's definitely when they're going to figure out you're, you're an imposter. Mm -hmm. I think like once you start uh, not giving a shit about it, basically, <laughs> it's when mm -hmm. you grow because then you start asking questions. Yeah. And that's also good as well. For instance, as I've been helping in the last couple of uh, weeks. I helped, I've been helping reviewing the, the SolidJS documentation. Um, Attila asked me to start giving a, sh a shot on that yep. and then I was sh sharing with Dave now with um, mm -hmm. with Sarah as well and I started doing mm -hmm. I was starting reviewing the documentation and I was reviewing that and I was like okay but there are these things that I'm reading I know what they are but should we assume that someone that comes to this documentation having no idea what this topic is knows what this what this is supposed to mean so mm -hmm. once you start assuming this perspective of sometimes you don't know everything, especially when you're reviewing mm -hmm. stuff, it really yeah. helps like, especially like with documentation. I think like that's, you definitely probably should have a lot of experience on this part as well, because I, I, I remember <laughs> we already shared it briefly about this before, mm -hmm. but you're using that as a, a way to push your learnings as well. But at the same yeah. time, you're finding that in a way, okay, how can we make sure that more people will get to this part and fully understand this thing? And I think that's the mindset we need yeah. to have when we're going to documentation. Yeah, I mean, it's it's always very difficult. Like, how how deep do you want to go? Like, I don't want to explain all of the JavaScript concepts in the Astro documentation, for instance. There are some things that you have to assume they already know or mm -hmm. have to point through. To the other and that's where yeah. we came up with, with something called um, community recipes or community uh, links. And the thing is, we have so many blogs online and so many genius people, mm -hmm. so many people that are actually more smart than me. So I'll gladly add in a link um, in the Astro Docs to some other blog. I'm totally fine with that because I don't want to maintain something that I don't know that well. For instance, how to use Astro with technology X. Mm -hmm. We do have some couple official guides that we do maintain. Most of them are community driven, but some of them are so specific and so difficult in a sense that we just say, hey, here is a community link to someone else's blog post that explains it perfectly. And yeah. then it's not my responsibility anymore to maintain that. Uh, we actually, one of the more extreme examples about that is um, our Deno adapter. So mm -hmm. we have SSR in in. Um, in Astro, and one of those possibilities is using SSR with Astro on Deno. Um, but we are actually not really good in doing that. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> we actually transferred all of the, the repos just to Deno organization. And now Deno supports it. And they have their the own sense, docs, yeah. and we can just say, hey, they have the adapter, they have the maintainability. 
we have the same problem with Bun. Bun is not not compatible 100% yet as of this recording. Um, and they do support Astro, but Astro doesn't support Bun yet. Okay. So we point to them as being, hey, if you want to learn more about using Bun with Astro, you can totally read it to them, but don't make issues in our repo because we don't support them yet. Makes sense. So it's yeah. always a difficult thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, there is nothing wrong with leaving some documentation outside of your own documentation, but at least I think it should be possible to point to something else mm -hmm. where you can um, where you can learn the presumed well the assumed knowledge. But but I can put I can put to agree with that. Like I think that that's but when you're reviewing it, I think that's important as well to note because mm -hmm. that's when you figure out okay how or where are we going to point yeah. this to. Um, yeah. That's why it's important when you're reviewing this thing. Okay, are we? What is the knowledge that we are assuming? And if yeah. so, where do we redirect people? Where do we send people to? Because most of the times, when we go to docs, we just go to the part that we are struggling with. I don't yeah. know anyone that has went to the entire documentation on something. I did that with Remix when uh, last year or something like that. But it was because mm -hmm. I was ac actually curious on everything and I had a lot of time. But Nobody does that just for the sake of doing it. Uh, so no, no, exactly. it's important that you have some knowledge that you understand where are you going, where you're not going, and what the part that you want to assume. In the meantime, I just remember something that I was supposed to get back to in the conversation and I didn't went to, and mm -hmm. because we talked about. So sorry for seeing the, docu the no, no, conversation. No, no, don't, don't worry. Now, don't worry about but, it. But um, we're talking about the part on why am I going to do stuff that other person already did a couple of... yes minutes ago that was <laughs> one of the things that I, that I was struggling with um, and then I saw this tweet from William William Johnson um, I think mm -hmm. he's working at OutZero right now or he, or he was um, but um, Will did this tweet on basically it was the description description on why should I write something that someone already did and mm. the tweet was a photo of an aisle of a shopping market with a full list of different uh, water, uh, water bottles. So mm. there's different brands of water. There's different bottles. There's different, and people still buy each different version of water. You might like mm. this brand. You might like this brand. And the same thing applies to knowledge sharing. I might be reading something or I might, might be listening something that I relate mostly with your style of teaching it. I might not mm -hmm. relate with the style of other person teaching it. Maybe you explain some nuances better than I do. Maybe you, sh you write is better than I do in certain ways. So there's different styles for people for water. So why shouldn't it be for, for content? And mm -hmm. basically that's also one of those moments in my life that changed the way that I look at stuff. And it's mm -hmm. basically every time someone says this thing, because that's still a, when I'm helping people started to do talks or do stuff, that's something that I've, Heard a bunch, and I hear almost every time. Oh, oh I'm not gonna do this. Uh, this famous person already did it. I was like, okay, but right. nobody ever heard you did do that version. And I think that's a motivation that we need to have because it might not, we might not consider it interesting. But it's once you start seeing people relate with it and start see people way that they engage with it and the way that they learn stuff from your content, then you start definitely seeing. Okay, so. Basically, there's a there's a a way in a world where my way of showing stuff actually works, um, and yes. that's kind of like the mindset that that I always try to to share with, and helps me steer from the oh why should I do a talk about testing library when the creator of it released a, a paid course for it, a bunch of stuff for it, a bunch of content live streams. Why should I do it? Well, nobody has mm -hmm. ever heard me do that thing, and basically because I ended up having that change of heart back then i ended up doing the same version of the talk around the world and around different stuff so sometimes having this m change in mindset is is good um this was i don't know this felt like very inspiring in in a sense like i said i think this discussion yeah. is being very ter not therape 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 ther ther therapeutic therapeutic <laughs> man translations uh, i feel like don't worry this is the time where I, where i quote sara vieira English is, is not my main language. Don't judge me. Um, so that's basically what what I what I wanted to say on that part. <laughs> I don't know. Do you have thoughts yeah, yeah, on it? Yeah, no. I, I am just mind blown, actually. 
Because, yeah, it, we, we, I think we have said so many valuable things. Um, I do have a couple of questions left, like before we round up. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it are very easy questions. One of them being, um, we have so many new technologies now. Um, but what technologies and libraries are you excited about? Oh, okay. I'm going to go to the obvious answer at this point, which is Soul.js. Yes. Obviously. And now, so it start, the second version, second beta just came out. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of stuff that changed there. Um, I don't know. Nitro. Every, there's a, yeah. like, it's like I, I've said to a lot of people and I, I was, I was actually, when I was preparing for our session today, I was actually mm-hmm. rewatching the, the interview you did with Attila and Attila m- mentioned something there when we were talking about in React Norway. Um, mm-hmm. and basically I feel like, and I think it's the same way that you feel about Astro. Um, the mm-hmm. people behind Solid are such humble people and with such knowledge and they're always sharing. And yeah. when you see this mindset, you kind of just are just drawn to it. Um, that's mm-hmm. basically what happened to me with Ryan. Like the first time that this person that didn't know me from anywhere sat down with me and basically started dumbing down his knowledge to make sure that he could explain something to me so I could be on the same level as he was explaining that, even if it was un- yeah. unintentionally. That's the, ty- the type of people that I want to be around and be mm-hmm. drawn to. And basically, well, I feel like the solid community starts going the same way. And I feel like Astro is, yeah. the, is the same thing as well. Um, and I'll be supporting solid as, as, as long <laughs> as I can, because now, especially with the, the love that the community is getting and the launch of solid start the, the launch of solid started better too and the stuff that's coming mm-hmm. up the future is bright but at the same time I'm still a, a huge supporter of Astro because I have fr- <laughs> I have friends working working on it so I'm super excited <laughs> to see what's coming next for Astro as well oh yeah M- me too actually me too. I can't say too much <laughs> can't wait to yeah, talk about it <laughs> <laughs> exactly we'll do a recap episode once once we released it um I do have another question and it, this is a very difficult one. When when I got asked it by by Eamon for the first time, I actually really struggled to answer. Where do you see web development in five years? The crazy thing is, if you only look back on this five years, mm-hmm. there is so much have been going. Like fine grained reactivity, completely new, didn't exist five years ago. But that's, well, in that's, the same form. That's the thing. Like I, I was actually. And basically, this might turn into a talk because I was braining, brainstorming mm. some ideas. I couldn't sleep like two nights ago and it was like 3 a.m. and I was taking notes. And basically, mm-hmm. one of the ideas I was talking about was something on this sense, which is... And this is something that people are discussing a lot. And that we, you were not there on the React Day Berlin panel because it was the same time as your talk when we were talking about the future of frontends. Yeah. Um, but... Basically, we are starting, people are saying, oh, now React is doing what PHP was doing a couple of years ago. Or yeah, we are that. doing yeah. this that we were doing 10, 15, 5, 7, 6 years ago. Because they were good ideas. That's kind of, <laughs> that's kind of the thing that happened on web development. I don't have this context of web development yeah. because I started as a back-end person. I was a Java guy, a C, a C, a C mm-hmm. sh- uh, Sharp guy. And then I transitioned to web like five, six years ago, something like that. I used to do PHP when I started programming as well on the side. But so I have some familiarity with with this, but Mm -hmm. basically we are not, we are not reinventing the wheel. We are basically picking up concepts that we were doing for years, but we didn't have the technology to keep track with them or be in the ideal world. Mm -hmm. So... In five years, maybe we'll be using something that was not that was not working last year or two years ago or something. But now we have the technology to keep track of it. In an ideal yeah. world, to me, and this is something that I am brainstorming a lot and, and thought about during that panel came up with me, me was in an ideal world, I just write my code and I don't have to worry about nuances. So what I mean by this is, I don't have to worry about re-renders. I don't have to worry about memoization. I don't have to worry about mm. these things. This is the I- the ideal world where I just write something and there's no prep, um, what's the word? No concern on the underneath. Yeah. So there's all the specification on what we have with React, what we had mm-hmm. with PHP, what we have with Solid, with Vue, with Svelte, whatever. 
Ideally, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have to concern be concerned about what runs on the client, what runs on the server. This is where I would like to be in five years. Yeah. We probably won't. It will take a bit more, but ideally, as a developer, I mean, you don't, have to, you don't yeah. have to worry about these things. Uh, we should leave those things to the to the authors, to the maintainers, which which is also something where I want to be in five six years. I want to be able to contribute to these things and help grow because. I found that these are the things that excite me and I started getting mm -hmm. more excited lately than just writing production code and shipping stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, in this case, shipping products, in this case, not building the stuff that yeah. needs to ship products. So in a short, in a short uh, answer, in five years, we'll probably be where we are right now or where we were <laughs> a couple of years ago, but with better yeah. ways to do stuff that we're I, not doing. I always tell people like, in, in my opinion, the web feel kind of like a pendulum or, or like a Christmas tree. It's a yeah. triangle and we are always going in the triangle up, up, up and till we reach that point in the middle above. That's where we want to be. But right now we're always swinging in between yeah. two very extremes and we'll get there eventually. Let's see. <laughs> Let's hope so. Uh, because that, that I could also <laughs> add a joke there, which well, we're going to say, oh, okay, but we're going to be where we are right now, but with 500 new frameworks yeah. doing the same thing. That oh yeah, also um, be the the mm. the other point of it, but um, I I think like in a JavaScript ecosystem we need to eventually standardize, which is something that we don't True. like to. But mm. one other thing that we were discussing in the same panel, like on another note, and I'm extending this conversation a bit more. Sorry, but uh, is worry. the if you look at other languages, other frameworks outside of the JavaScript ecosystem, they are focused on doing the objective and doing you the tools, giving you the tools to do an objective. So mm -hmm. what I mean by this is if you see typically a framework on other language, it's going to give you routing, it's going to give you services for emails, it's going to give you all mm -hmm. the stuff that you would need to build a, a production application without yeah. having to install extra packages. Uh, mm. This is something that, you, that you've seen in other frameworks happen and we don't have in JavaScript because there's a bunch of libraries to do the same thing and a bunch of stuff to do the same thing. Yeah. I don't have a strong opinion about this. I'm just sharing some facts on what's happening outside of our world and that I don't know what it might happen here. I have no idea. I, who am I to comment on these things? I, I'm just sharing on something that's funny that you see when you step yeah, a foot outside, outside of our world. Well, I don't know. I guess one of the reasons... Oh, go ahead. Um, no, but share what you're going to say then. I'll, 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 I'll I was going to say that one of the reasons I think that, that this is different in between JavaScript and a language like PHP or C Sharp is that JavaScript was created for the web for interactivity. It was mm -hmm. initially not a backend language. So people started building things that weren't actually supposed to, to be run. Yeah. Well, of course they are now. And it makes sense, but something like, for instance, PHP was created to fetch databases. Agree. In a sense, JavaScript was never intended to. And now we're saying that we that we need those things definitely. That that's a good way a good way of looking <laughs> at it. Um, I think, like for instance, we there are people going in a direction. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's the right, the wrong one, but mm. Kent is doing a, a epic stack. So basically, it's just mm -hmm. a remix stack, whereas all these opinionated libraries and yep. tools for building a full stack application. So that's a way of looking at it. So that's mm -hmm. definitely a, a direction. Now let's mm. see how, how it goes. Like I think that Kent is definitely one of the persons to push this and let's see how the, how the community will keep reacting on it. Uh, pun reacting. Sorry. I was going to start doing <laughs> framework puns. Um, so yeah. yeah. Thoughts. I don't have a strong opinion. Sometimes I just have these random mm. thoughts and I, I felt on commenting on it. <laughs> no, no, it, I mean, it, it does make sense. And I think we, we did cover a lot. Like we went from speaking to, to, to how the language JavaScript was defined. And, and, and to ter we did a lot of, I did, at least I did a lot of therapy on this session. So <laughs> that's good to hear. That's you good to hear. You charge by the hour or, or yeah. by... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, let's uh, extend this call with another hour. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, it was great to have you. Where can people reach you? So people can find me on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, at the end of Daniel JC of Phones. Same thing on LinkedIn, uh, GitHub, social media, pretty much. That's my handle everywhere. I think like if you just search that, eventually I'll show up. Um, <laughs> so 
yeah, people can reach out to me on that. On conferences, on events that you see me, please come talk to me. Mm -hmm. I would love to meet meet you. Um, if I don't remember your face from other event, I'm sorry. I'm terrible with faces sometimes. That's that's a struggle it that happens. I have. But well, this is a completely different thing. Uh, please reach out to me on those things. I would love to to hear thought, not, thoughts. Nothing makes me happier than people come up to me and say, "Oh, I saw you do this or saw you do that," and I believe the the same happens to you. And to everyone, like, okay, if someone reaches out to you, oh, I saw that you did that, uh, and now I have some feedback, whatever, that just makes my my, my day. So, yeah, Definitely. Daniel Gisifon, sorry. I, I speak a lot sometimes, and I start getting on these tangents. <laughs> it's allowed. Like, on podcasts, that's kind of the thing. So, so, so that's allowed. I'm, I'm a good person to bring <laughs> on these things, because I think yeah. like, if we wanted, we could be here more two, 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 three more hours. Just speaking. Yeah, and actually what people don't know is that we are already we were already in a call for yeah. an hour before. Uh, so and yeah, then, we have been going quite a while. And, then and we like, still could go an hour. Yeah, and to give feedback was uh, like what happened was we were starting to discuss something and then Elian said, oh, maybe we should stop and talk about this on, on the on the podcast. So basically this was why we <laughs> we started yeah. doing this because there were a lot yeah, of yeah. stuff that we were discussing already. <laughs> Yeah, that, but that's the whole thing. I feel like once you, you are friends and you're like both in the technology sector, ideas start flowing at random yeah. moments and it's cool to have them catch, captured and <laughs> you can listen to them later on. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and not just for us, also for the audience. No, thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. Um, if you want to see Daniel, maybe at React Paris, our CFP is still open. Um, Daniel, you did apply, right? I did submit and I'm still going to... Su the, uh, the CFP ends at, at the end of this month, right? I think so, yeah. Okay, so because so I still have... I was brainstorming, like I said, I was brainstorming new talks today, so I'm still going to submit by the end of the month some new talks, perhaps. We'll see. <laughs> but hopefully see. We'll, we'll see each other there, hopefully. Oh yeah, most definitely. <laughs> most definitely. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel, so much. And everyone else, uh, please check out Daniel. We have some links below in the description. And see you all in two weeks again for a new episode. Bye. Bye. <laughs>